Genesis chapter 21, and verse number 1. If you found it, say amen. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. I could stop right there and preach for a while on that. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. I preached this morning by the help of the Holy Ghost on the subject, Yes, the child shall be born. Yes, the child shall be born. Amen. Praise God. Well, for the Holy Ghost this morning. Praise God. I believe this is a special day in the, in the making. Something, something going to happen today. Praise God. Hallelujah. Anybody else believe that? This is the day. Amen, 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 amen. Praise God. You may be seated. Praise God. Well, I'll tell you that before the choir sang this morning, I almost felt like there was a prophecy or a message in tongues in this place. And I really felt the Lord speaking and saying <clears throat> that as he walked in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, he is going to walk in our midst today. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. There is nothing like the disappointment of feeling like time has passed and that something that you thought could have happened is now impossible to happen. Amen. In our earthly concepts and our way of thinking, there are particular restrictions and guidelines that we set. Even sometimes in our faith, we set those restrictions and guidelines. Well, I believe that God can up to a certain point. Right. And then after that, well, it's almost as though it's too far, too impossible. Amen. But uh, that's usually where God dwells, is in that little arena where you finally say, it's impossible. Well, yeah, praise God. Amen. Amen. And uh, I have no idea that when the word of the Lord came to Sarah and Abraham, that they were very excited uh, that they were going to have a child. And it was a promised child. And they... No doubt to told others of the so moved. Matter of fact, God changing the name of Abram to Abraham uh, was the fact that he was giving him a name before he ever gave him the performance or the reality of it. No doubt every time that this man told people his name, they questioned him, how can you be the father of many nations when you don't even have offspring as of yet? Well, I don't have offspring as of yet, but... God has said it's going to happen, and so I'm trusting and believing that it's going to take place. Hallelujah. I feel a special anointing in this place right now. Amen. I, I'm just telling you the name before it actually happens. And I'm just letting you know that God has spoken it. God is not a man that he should lie, neither is he the son of man that he should repent. If he said it, shall he not perform it? If he spoke it, shall he not bring it to pass? That's the word of the Lord. Amen. And no doubt they felt this is going to be the day, this is going to be the year, this is going to be the time. And only for time to slip past them. Amen. And uh, Abraham, he, uh, he, he's trying to believe. He's, he's doing all that he knows. And Sarah... 
Saul's trying to believe. And they even get a little impatient at one point in time and try to help God out and try to offer him a substitute. But I'm telling you, if God said, this is the body that I'm going to use, it doesn't matter how impatient we become. It doesn't matter how much we want it to come to pass. The fact is that uh, uh, we've got to learn to wait on God for that particular statement that he said in the text. And at the set time, God did as he had spoken. Amen. Everything that God does, there is a set time for him to do it in. Every purpose under the heaven, there is a particular air of time that God has designated to fulfill his divine purpose and intent. Amen. And the bottom line is, you just have to keep moving regardless of how you feel or what you see or how your emotions are touched. You just have to re realize that I've got to keep going forward. I've got to keep moving ahead because I've got to be at the right time, at the right place because it's going to come to pass and I want to be there when it does come to pass. I don't want to be too far behind or too far ahead. I want to be right on time with the will of God and the purpose of God. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. I, uh, I read this story, and there's a lot that you could talk about, a lot that you could preach about from this particular text. And uh, I, I find some humor in it, and, and that I find a lot of reality in it, and a lot of things that I can relate to, and I think we all can relate to. Amen. I, I want to tell you this morning that God is going to do as he has spoken. Just go with me a second. Amen. God is going to fulfill his word. Amen. I have been raised in a generation of apostolics. And they were killed going ever since I can remember. I have heard them preach about there's going to be a great end time revival. Praise God. There's going to be a move of God that has would see anything that we have ever seen or the world has ever seen. I heard it preached for years. I started preaching by hearing that preached. I have preached that and believed that and confessed it. Amen. But yet there are some who would say and some who would even laugh and mock by their statement. Well, I thought you said you was going to have this revival. Where is the revival among the apostolics? Amen. And I'm telling you today, the worst thing that can happen is for us to become impatient and try to produce something on our own. We do not need an Israel revival. Amen. We need to hold on the Holy Ghost. Something is about to happen. Something is about to transpire. Something is in the making while I'm preaching even right now. Something is going on in the heavenlies. Something is moving in the spirit realm right now. Amen. I believe that God has a set time. Again, I don't think it's time to become impatient and try to borrow the methods of some social something. Amen. But I believe that the true church will just wait on God. There's something that God is about to break loose upon the earth. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, 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 amen. I, uh, I I read this story and I, I I I take it and I the parallel with it and I look at it and I, I study it and I apply it to where I feel like I am and you are and we all are and there's a lot of similarities. Amen. We 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 well I could probably say we've already produced it or small some aspects of it and. and uh, Ishmael mocks Isaac, and all we can go into all this stuff in here and take a lot of time to it. But uh, you see, there, there's some things about this that uh, uh, it's kind of kind of neat to apply. Have you ever read over there where uh, Abram went down to Gerar, country south, the king there? And uh, I, I get a little tickled at this story because uh, they, they, they're getting on up there in years. And Abraham is pushing 100 and says so 90. And uh, they go down to the country. This is just prior to Sarah having this child. And uh, they get down there. And the Bible says that the king seen Sarah and desired to have her as his wife. Now, maybe that doesn't bother you. But that story really bothered me for a while. Uh, we, <laughs> we, 
we either got something going on here we don't realize that we've got one wood sick puppy on our hands right here. I don't know too many men that could have basically anybody in the land they wanted that would choose a 90 year old to be a part of his bride. I don't see too many of you young men driving down to the nursing home scouting out prospects. <laughs> That's what I thought. See, sometimes we just read over some of these stories and never even apply it. And I, I kept in that, kept thinking, my God, baby, I'm carnal. I don't know. I, I kept thinking, what in the world with this joker? He's, I mean, he's looking at this 90 year old lady. He said, I want it from a wife. And uh, I, again, I thought either, either this guy is one weird joker or something else is in the story that we're overlooking him. And uh, then, then I got to thinking, uh, and I tried to bring it to uh, just some good common sense study. And uh, I got to realize that if this is going to be the, the, the body that God is going to use to burn this promised child, now, you've got to understand, this promised child is more than just appeasing the, the, the desire of an old couple that wants to have children. This has got to do with, with lineage, and it's got to do with the fact that the promise was that the seed of a woman is going to bruise his head, and it's got to come to a particular people. And so, this is a part of God's divine destiny. This is a part of something that God has foretold. It's more than just an older couple wanting kids and finally getting one. This is the will of God and the plan of God. This is a child of promise. And I got to thinking now, why in the world would God give this baby to a woman that couldn't take care of it? He's not going to give this promised child to a woman that's in old age that cannot and does not have the strength to take care of that child. I don't believe that for one minute. Amen. I am of the conclusion that when God began to touch Sarah, and in the touch where the king desired to have her, that God was already reviving her youth. He was putting back to her her youthfulness. So I think that makes sense out of the story. <laughs> I see Abraham waking up and saying, Sarah, I don't know what you've been drinking, but drink some more of it, baby. You're looking younger all the time. I don't act that holy man, man. No, 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 don't even start there, amen. And, and I'm convinced that he said, if I'm going to allow this lady to take care of this child, I want to make sure that she's got enough strength. And I can't have her try to chase a two-year-old around on a pole. <laughs> and so I'm going to have to restore her youth. Oh, I don't believe that. Well, you believe she's 90 years old and can have a baby? Why can't God restore her youth? You have to do something to her. Now it's a list to me. I'm convinced that God is not going to give this revival child to a spiritual old age church. Something that's sort of came and said it all, trying to get by. I don't believe that for one minute. If there's going to be an apostolic revival, it's coming to a church. Don't tell me that. It's coming to a church that has its youthfulness restored. It's not in spiritual old age. It's in the aspect of the truth. Like King of the Book of Acts. Hallelujah. It's not something they're over. I'm not trying to make mockery of anybody. It doesn't need a cane. It doesn't need a walker. It doesn't need a wheelchair. Oh, I'm telling you today, it's a church that has the faith of its youth. And the vibrancy of its youth. Hallelujah. Somebody needs to start praying right now. It's starting to be the joy. That's the kind of church the survival is coming to. It's not coming to a stoic dead church. It's not coming to a church that just wants to talk about the past. It's not coming to a congregation that's laid back at ease and complacent and at ease in Zion. It's coming to a church that has its servancy. He said, I tell you why I'll remove your candlestick. You've left the first love. But it's coming to a church that says, I still love him more than I love life. I love him more than I love the world. I love him. 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 That's where revival is coming. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Praise 
God. Hallelujah. Now, let, let me cut through a bunch of stuff. Let me just cut through a bunch of stuff and just tell you a couple of things. In uh, 1991, the latter part of 91, I had a friend of mine call me. And uh, he, he told me, he said, Brother Morgan, and Brother Kilgus, uh, you heard these words. He said, the Lord spoke to me in prayer, and I'm going to tell you what he said. He said, set your house in order for God's fixing to change your life. And there's some things fixing to happen. And so I took it very serious and spent a season of prayer and fasting, seeking God. And uh, there was a process of things that happened. I don't have time to do it all of it. But in the course of it, uh, in one night, uh, very, in the very near future, I'm going to preach on God's perspective of the miraculous. I'll talk to you about the children's bread. And uh, I, uh, I, I, it was just a lot of things that happened. And it was a, it was a special time and uh, a lot of great things, a lot of serious things that happened. But in the course of all of this is when God began to do it about this particular message. And then there were several confirmations. And I'm not here, I'm not, this is not an ego trip, and I'm not here trying to tell you a story about me. It really, in reality, has to do with you. And uh, in the course of all this, the Lord began to deal with me and said, I'm going to change your ministry, and you will become like a midwife, and I will send you to churches that are heavy with child, because I'm going to birth this child to the church in the end time. And I was preaching for David, Brother David Shotwell one night on, uh, and, uh, oh God, his Okino church was so locked up. How old he called me to come preach, and I thought, oh David, please don't make me come down here and preach. I'd just take a beating and preach there. My guy's like driving off the end of the world into this abyss, this darkness, and I was like, oh, and I'd go preach and fight the devils and fight them before church, dead church, and after church. <laughs> And uh, I didn't come to the point, I thought, my God, I, this place is hopeless. And one night on the platform, uh, everything just left. And I seen a young lady, this young lady was, was pregnant, and she was on her knees, and there's a man standing above her, and he had his hand drew back like he was going to slap her. He never did her. But he was intimidating her. He was, it's like he's going to slap her. She was doing this. And she was pleading with him not to hurt her, not to hurt the child. And uh, he, he kept laughing at her, just laughing. And finally, it's, you could see her. She looked beyond him. It's like it's a light. And then just out of the perimeter, that light was about, coming out of that darkness, coming out of the perimeter, was another man. And when she seen this man, her whole countenance changed. And she was not fearful anymore. Neither was she intimidated. And because of the countless change, the man is trying to hit her seen her. And seen it and recognized and turned and seen the other man, he began to back away and was very fearful of the second man. And the Lord told me in the vision, said, I'm showing you what's happening in the spirit realm. I'm showing you my church that's pregnant, I promise. And I'm showing you how the enemy has tried to intimidate her and strike at her. But very soon will I come out of the darkness to the church. This child is going to be born. Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, just a few days after that, Another time praying, but I spoke to me in some time. I hope that doesn't bother you. He said, Lord spoke to me. In some places it makes me nervous. And the killer, in this time of visitation, the Lord said, Now that you understand, I send you as a midwife, and I've showed you a little of that's taking place. I'm going to tell you three things that you must warn churches of that are pregnant with this promise. And the first one, he said, is for them not to abort the child. So it's, it's, and I, I don't want to be graphic, but it's pleasurable to conceive a child, but it's a little more 
discipline and responsibility and there's a taxation on the body to carry this child. He said, a lot of my churches enjoy the, the emotion of revival conception, but they don't want to carry it, and they don't want to produce it, and so they conceive it, they carry it for a season, and then they get this, they just lose interest, and they abort the child. Well, praise God. I've seen churches abort them before. I mean, revivals in the womb of the church, and they just got careless, and uh, forgot to take care of the child and thought that they could do everything they've done before, not understanding that uh, when we're carrying a child, there's a few things that change. You don't go where you used to go. You can't wear what you used to wear, and you can't run, jump, and skip and do all these wonderful things. Well, praise God. And a lot of churches have conceived a revival, but they've aborted it. I wonder, I wonder outside the confines of some of our churches how many small caskets we have. I wonder how many markers and tombstones we have signifying aborted revivals. Well, praise God. And then we do another. Now I'm being real. I'm being honest. We get something stirred. We get something. We don't talk about this revival. We're talking about the past. And then we just, I was in a church one time. I'm telling you, brother, it was, it was happening. It was there in summertime here. <laughs> Good parallel. Summertime hit. And Pastor Miller said, You can keep coming back on Tuesday nights if you want, but he said, But it's a vacation's coming and we all take vacations and we're going to close the Bible. And I thought, Oh boy. We wait for months to get this to this one point, and that vacations are more important than revival. And so let's just abort this child and go on, forget it. A few months later, he told me to come back, and I said, It's not fair. I can't come back. He said, well, can we just pick up where we left off? I said, no, you don't understand. That'd be like a woman telling her body, okay, I'm going to take a little break from this pregnancy. Uh, from the fourth month to the fifth or sixth month, let's just take a little break, and I'll come back where they're to pick the pregnancy back up. I don't know how you women said, I wish that could happen. But it doesn't happen that way. Are you still with me? Amen. Second thing he said to warn them about is infection in the body. And when he gave to us an infection, he said, the world cannot come in. I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about the spirit. So it's like toxemia poisoning that starts spreading through the body. So what it does is it causes the child to be born with disformities. So you may produce the child, but it won't be in the health that it should have been in. Now, I'm talking no key, but I'm talking to you straight this morning. Let me tell you, not here picking on anybody, not here shooting, just, just being real with you, honest. We, we, we feel sometimes because of crowds and auditoriums and these things full, there must be something wrong with the church. But let me tell you, other women may be producing a lot of offspring, but you've got to remember, is this the promised child? Is this the body that God said it would come through? I'm convinced it's not coming outside of truth. Amen. I'm sorry, but I'm convinced of that. But I'm proving the scripture. I am strongly studying today that if somehow we can keep the infection out, not that it just affects the moment, but eventually it affects the child. The world, the spirit of the world, does not need to come into the church of the living God. We do not need it to attract the crowd. We don't have to act like the world, look like the world, talk like the world, walk like the world, come out from among them and be you separate, saith the Lord. Love not the world, not of the things that are in the world, for if any man love the world, then the love of the Father is not in him. That's still in the book unless you put it out in your Bible. So we cannot afford to allow infection to come into the church. When I talk about people coming to the church, I'm talking about a spirit that comes into the church. A spirit that says, we don't need that anymore. I'm telling you, we need everything that the Bible teaches, preaches, and enforces. Amen. Praise God. I'm convinced that if somehow the church can maintain and hang on, there's something coming that's going to blow the minds of a lot of Pentecostals and it's going to attract the attention of the world. It's coming. It's coming. 
also with me. Third thing he said warned them of, and again the verse of scripture. And the verse of scripture dealt with the fact that when two men are striving, and in other words, fighting, and by chance one of them would uh, just swing his arm or something and hit a woman that was pregnant. And if the baby was damaged, hurt, if it was born blind, then the law said that the judgment was not determined by the mother, the judgment was determined by the father. And the father had the right to extract limb for limb, eye for eye, or life for life. In other words, if the baby was born dead, the father could require by the law that whoever caused that child to be born dead had to die. If it was born blind because of this, then they would pluck out the eyes of whoever did it. And uh, it's easy sometimes to get to fussing about something and uh, because of anger or your own agenda you get to throw them on your arms and the next thing you know you hit something you shouldn't hit yeah. one of the greatest things that happens of this revival that I've seen through the years is just about the time mama gets pregnant starts carrying a child somebody finds something to find out well, oh, praise God. I've seen revival start to break up in the church and somebody get mad because their kid didn't get the same special required because they didn't know about it. None of those things don't happen in Texas. These are just problems in all the other United States. <laughs> and uh, somebody drove the van, forgot to put gas in it, didn't pull it back up, and they got it back in. That's all it takes to start serving the in the church. So it's quiet. <laughs> And uh, somebody forgot to do this, or somebody forgot to turn lights off, or somebody said something about one year of balance, or the youth we were corrected your child, or let's try this one on the side. The principal dealt with your little bad luck. Somebody said, don't talk about my kids, they're angels. Well, you better hope they're not angels. Angels can't even be saved. <laughs> or whatever. Somebody didn't like the way the church handled something. Oh, well, Pastor Kid, well, if you just done this and done that. And that mess, instead of understanding that nobody, oh God, I just hit something right there. Nobody in the church, regardless, I don't care how intelligent, how smart, how knowledgeable, how keen, how involved you are, nobody in the church has the whole story. Matter of fact, matter of fact, oh boy, uh, there's a little story in the Bible where a Levite was going through one of the cities that was part of the heritage tribes of Benjamites. And these men raped and molested his concubine and murdered her. And so this guy takes her and cuts her into 11 pieces. And he takes a piece of her body, wraps it, and sends it to each tribe. And then he says, I want you to look at this, and then tell me what you think. And they said, this is horrible. And they all decide, we're going to do something about this. And so they all come to battle. And 80-something thousand or 90-something thousand men died one day over something they didn't even know the whole story about. It's easy to take a piece of evidence and form an opinion and fight about something you don't even know the whole story about. But you think because you got a little piece of the evidence, you know the whole story. <laughs> and the bottom line is the only person in the church basically that has the oversight and has basically all the, I don't know if some things get by the pastor, but I'm talking about you doing stuff. Nobody in this congregation has the total picture except the leadership of the church. And it's easy for you to have a piece of something and really limited information and you go out forming something and get people involved in a fight. They don't even know really what the whole story about. And innocent people start dying and you would rather destroy a revival than you had to keep your mouth shut. I feel like I'm going to come me right now. Well, it's wrong. But let me tell you something. 
very long time ago. But if I just put it in the hands of God, if something's wrong, sooner or later, God will deal with it. But the more I try to involve myself with it, the more to show my side of the story, the more muddy it gets, and the more contaminated it gets, and the more bitter I become, and the more cynical I become, and the more judgmental I become. I said, I not only destroy myself, but a little bitterness sets up in my soul, and it not only destroys me, but it starts to follow me that are around about me. Oh, praise God. I'm telling somebody today, you need to put your sword down and put it in the hands of God and understand this revival is more important than my little agenda. Help me, Holy Ghost. Well, I just don't think judgment is needed. And we're not the judgment seat. Get out of it. God sits in the judgment seat. But just be careful how you judge. Unless you be judged by the same measure. And I found out something a long time ago. Usually whatever people are falsely accusing me of, they're guilty themselves. I'm going to tell this church something. There is not one thing worth you losing a revival over. There's not one situation worth you flay in your arm in a moment of your own ambition or desire or anger and hidden something that calls of this child to be born maimed or crippled or to be stillborn. Amen. I'm telling you, this church is pregnant with promise right now. Something is in the birth canal right now. The pains of birth are gripping the church right now. It's not time to find something to fight about. It's time to pitch. It's time to get involved. It's time to put my best effort. It's time to give it everything that I've got. It's not time to sit on the sidelines and poke and tell everybody how to do it. It's time to come out of the stands and get on the playing field. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Woo! Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. I got to tell you what Polio said. See, Mm. Let me tell you where a lot of the same time the Bible preaching started. Started in Texas. <laughs> started in Texas. I feel like an old prophet right now. Started in Texas. Some of the strongest voices. I want this church listening this morning. Forget everything else. Just sit right here. I want you to listen to me. Say. And some of the strongest advocates and voices. So the same time revival started and was lifted up in Texas. Right. The seed of end time revival, a part of it was in Texas, and a lot of it in the early part of the 1900s was in Houston. Right. Okay, you listen. Yeah. Right. And God made a promise. I'm going to give revival. And through the years, through the years, but some of them got a little impatient and went and got him a Hagar and produced an Ishmael. But there's still a remnant that says, We're waiting on God. It's going to happen. I want to provoke some old prophecies here today. I want to provoke some things that some have just almost discarded. The church, the church is in the process of the youth being restored and revival coming to it. But I'm going to tell you what I see and what I feel. There's a lot of things happening. I was on the phone this past week with another evangelist, and I said, you know, brother, Texas is getting hit pretty hard right now. There's a lot of stuff going on. All the way from Pastor Kilgore's wife, young preachers been in tragic car wrecks, campground, catching the fire. There's a lot of stuff going on. And I'm trying to figure it all out. And I'm waiting on God. God, if you just give me a word, if I could just say something to him. If I could just walk to the pulpit and tell him everything's going to be all right. But you know what? I can't get that release. And I've sought for that release. And I've begged God for it, Lord. 
To the point, I, I'll tell you this. That a few weeks ago, when I was in Lake Charles, before Sister Magoo was diagnosed with cancer and all this stuff, I dreamed about standing in the Kenneth pulpit, and I said, the miracle all depends on your obedience and your belief in the word of God. And the scene changed. And there were three women standing, two of them standing beside a woman in the middle. She was bent over, double over. And I said, who's that? And I said, oh, that's Sister Timmy. And I said, what's wrong with her? So she's got cancer. And I said, no, she don't have cancer. This is a tormenting spirit sent from hell to death at the church. And when I said it, Sister Timmy's head snapped up. My eyes were like they were going to bulge out of her head. And I rebuked the tormenting spirit. She fell backwards, delivered. And I've even asked God, God, is that a sign to us? That you're giving us dominion over this demon of cancer? Yeah. I'm asking the Lord. I'm, listen, listen, listen to me. I'm asking the Lord all these questions. Why? What are these dreams for? This is sickness and disease? Where is the power of God to heal? Maybe you're not asking yourself these questions, but I am. God, I preach that you are delivered and that you're here. And I'm going to fast and pray and do whatever I need to do to break into a new dimension to get it done. Let me tell you what, I feel strong in the Holy Ghost. When that baby's been born, there's a lot of pain. And there's a lot of struggle. The closest a woman ever comes to dying at there is, without the actual merit of it, is when she's birthing that child. And a lot of these things that are happening is nothing more but birth pains to the church. No, I don't like it. I wish I could change the law of nature of every female. Tell you, there's no pain in birthing a child. It's just everything's greater, everything's fine. But I can't tell you that. And I'd be lying to tell you that. Every one of you women would be falsely accused or would accuse me of being a liar here today because that's not true. But the more that I'm telling you, when that baby's being born, there's a lot of pain happening. And I'm telling you right now that what we're feeling are birth pains. And it's the throes of death. There's something is being born. Something is happening in the spirit. Something's going on, folks. It's here this morning. It ain't time to board. It's not time for the world. And it's not time to fight. In the morning, we feel pain. I understand you feel pain. I've been praying for your pain. I ask God to let me feel your pain, believe it or not. But I'm telling you, there's something happening right now in this congregation. This thing is much bigger than a little local revival. A few folks praying through us in good services. I'm telling you, we're standing in the very threshold of prophecy being fulfilled. And what's about to happen is going to affect the little world. Shatola Bakita Lalabaha. God wants to visit Houston and Texas again. This is where the voice of end time revival first started. This is where it was held and lifted up. This church has had it preach stronger than any church I know of. It's not time for us to back up and say it's not going to happen. It's time for us to understand that this is the set time of which God has appointed. It's not time to be sloppy and carnal. It's not time to be worldly. It's not time to be frightened. It's not time to be careless. I'm telling you, the church is still in the pains of the survival even now. They have shut that up behind.
interest in the Senate. I don't understand my boundaries. <clears throat> I don't want to say anything foolishly. So years ago, I was in Lake Charles. And on one of the service nights, the prophecy went forth and said, but I will send an angel of judgment to pass through the south. And after it is passed, they will say how the mighty have fallen. And then I will visit the south again in a great outpouring of my spirit. I have wondered why. And just let me talk to you for my heart's sake. You know, if you would think that any state would be bombarded with worldliness, it would be California. But the spirit of worldliness has attacked more of the South than it has any other district that I know of or area. And it all makes sense to me this morning. Because he knows he's, the enemy's doing everything he can to destroy the sea. The state has been in a, in a spiritual struggle, Brother Kilgore. God, I mean that God puts you in the leadership position so that, it, so that the body wouldn't be destroyed and the sea would be protected. I mean that. Anybody else would have killed the body. They'd have killed it. And there's a lot of things happened and a lot of things happening. I've never seen a city a ministry so attacked by immorality and so on and so forth. And you can blame it on people if you want, but the bottom line is the enemy is doing everything it can to destroy the seed. But there is a remnant. And Sarah is still alive. And Abraham still believing. It's time. I want to talk to you young people. Don't you listen to me? It's my time for you to try to look and act like the world. You are a part of something that has been destined by God through the ages for this very critical, crucial moment. It's not time for carnality. I'm talking to everybody now. It's not time to love the world on Monday through Saturday and try to love God on Sunday. This is a crucial time. This thing is being born. We've carried it through the years. And now it's in the birth canal. And you're feeling the pain of it. And God will do whatever he has to do to put you on your knees and to get you to cry out. Elder, even if he has to touch a beloved of the church. And I hate to say it that way, but I'm talking to you from the heart. Some of you ought to feel condemned this morning. That you wouldn't pray on your own. That God has to shake you to get you to pray. But something's being born right now. The pain of birth is here this morning. I'll tell you what's fixing to happen. The revival that you've heard preached for years. Well, the day the shot will come at 1 o'clock this morning. So I, I just didn't talk to you for a moment. I know you're resting. I'm tired. I won't talk to you. He said, a friend of mine, but Scott Shelton, pastors in Moses, who took John for Silver's church a few years ago, said, Brother Barnes just called him and told him, he said, I'll tell you what I see coming to the church. He said, I see it. He said, nothing is going to change as far as some spectacular something. But he said, I see men laying hands on eyes without eye sockets. And he said, eyes are instantly right there. He said, I see them laying hands on cancer and cancer is falling off. He said, I'm telling you, something's fixing to happen immediately to the church. We're standing right there feeling the birth pains of that. 
God's going to visit the church in a miraculous way that the church has never seen since the book of Acts. The miraculous is about to break loose in the church. Not some sensational side show, but because the time demands the church be empowered with Holy Ghost and further people. Something's coming to Houston. Something's coming to Texas. It's going to sweep across you like a prayer fire. Let that flame start in Houston this morning. Let it be like the top of Mount Carmel. Let the earth of the Lord be built today. And let the fire fall that needs to fall. It's time for God to prove who his people really are. I would have got somebody to cry out with me right now and pray. Why don't you allow that which is trying to move in you to happen right now? Why don't you allow it to express itself right now? That needs to be the sound of travail coming from the church this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save.